Nozanin Boniardi, congratulations on being the recipient of the 2023 Sydney Peace Prize. We've um, long seen you campaign for human rights, particularly in Iran. At the moment, the world, but particularly the Middle East, is going through conflict. What is your message of peace and can we actually really achieve peace in the region? Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's good to be with you. Um, if we want peace in the region, women have to be at the forefront. And when I look at the courage, the immense courage of women and girls in Iran who have galvanized Iranian society at large for democracy, I know that that's a real possibility. In a recent social media post, you stated that the Islamic Republic's strategic support of Hamas has diverted attention away from its ongoing crimes against the Iranian people and that if you care about Palestinian lives and liberation, the Islamic Republic and Hamas are no friend of yours. I'm just wondering why you gave this message. Was it really a message to those in the West who argue that Hamas is a form of resistance? Let's name it what it is. Hamas is a terrorist organization. And at the same time, we can hold two truths, that there are innocent Palestinians who are suffering deeply in Gaza. Um, and what we have to, I think, realize is that the Islamic Republic, the IRGC, are responsible for backing Hamas, for backing Hezbollah as their proxies and wreaking havoc in the region. Allow us to, to really address the root of the cause of the problem, which is the Islamic Republic regime. You've been part of a movement in the diaspora uh, that's calling for a secular democracy in Iran. If, if Iran does become a secular democracy, how does that change the state of play in the region? The people are showing, they're rising up and risking everything, their lives, to, to tell us what they want. They want uh, an end to theocracy. They want freedom. They're saying, not Gaza, not Lebanon, my life only for Iran. They're saying withdraw, essentially what that means is withdraw funding from Hamas withdraw funding from Hezbollah, put that money into your own, bank on your own people, support your own people, your own infrastructures, build Iran. A recent Senate inquiry into Iran's human rights abuses has called for the Australian government to list the IRGC, which is the military arm of Iran's government, as a terrorist organisation. Australia's government has responded that it doesn't have the powers to do this under the criminal code as that uh, code only applies to non-state actors, not state actors. What will your message to Penny Wong be when you meet her later this week? Well, I think if there are roadblocks, we need to remove the roadblocks. So if that means changing the code, um, then that's what we need to do. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps tasked with not protecting Iran or the Iranian people. It's tasked with protecting the Islamic Revolution and the ideology. Um, they are just like ISIS, just like Al-Qaeda, um, just like Hezbollah, who's radicalizing people beyond its borders, indoctrinating just like these other groups, and they're wreaking havoc through proxies that we've seen re very recently. Um, they have to be listed as such. It's been uh, more than a year since uh, the death in custody of Massa Amini and the birth of the Women, Life, Freedom movement. Is there any more the international community, including Australia's government, can do to help the Iranian people in their call for freedom? People think that this revolution is dead. That revolutionary fire is very much ablaze in the hearts and the minds of Iran's embattled protesters. Just days ago, we, we saw 16-year-old Armita Garavand uh, die at the hands of this regime for not wearing a veil. And um, history keeps repeating itself because a culture of impunity reigns supreme inside the country. And frankly, we're not doing enough to hold this regime to account. What does that support look like? First and foremost, they need internet access. Every time they rise up, the Islamic Republic regime cracks down on the internet. The Iranian communications minister who is responsible for the internet crackdown over the past year on the protesters to be able to kill them and silence them in darkness. 
was educated in Australia at the University of New South Wales. He got his PhD. His two children were born in Australia. And then he went back in 2016 and became uh, and is now the, the communication minister in Iran. He has been sanctioned for this injustice, for this grave injustice by the, by the European Union and the, the United States. He has not been sanctioned by Australia. Um, this needs to change. We can take away our support for regime cronies and re regime officials in places like Australia and lend our support to people who really need them, dissidents like uh, Shilan Mirzai, who is currently in Turkey, a vocal and powerful advocate for refugees, Iranian refugees, dissidents who are fleeing um, the terror at the hands of the IRGC and the Islamic Republic in Iran, trying to find a safe haven. She is about to be extradited from Turkey back to Iran, where she would undoubtedly be persecuted or possibly killed. The Australian government has actually sanctioned a number of IRGC individuals and entities, uh, but beyond the IRGC, uh, there is a, a lobby in the West, including in Australia, uh, that lobbies on behalf of the Islamic Republic informally. So these are Australian citizens uh, that uh, want to increase the Islamic Republic's pre presence on the world stage and that also target journalists, activists uh, like yourself who uh, speak out uh, in support of the Iranian people's calls for freedom. I'm just wondering whether how you've been a recipient of that and what you think countries like Australia can do to address this. You're right, Nassim. It's a, it's a huge problem for anyone who speaks out against the regime. They, it, the Islamic Republic invests large amounts of money and resources to its cyber army. Um, we in the West pale in comparison uh, in the amount of money that we spend on on countering propaganda that countries like Russia, China, Iran, um, or the Islamic Republic put out there. And, um, and part of this, these disinformation campaigns, these smear campaigns, these attacks on dissidents, people like you um, who, who report on facts, um, is, is to, to break us so that we stop reporting and stop shining a light on the truth. That's their intention. And now it's, I think it's incumbent upon us in the West to find ways to disempower them and empower dissident voices. Since March, China has facilitated historic talks between what were seen as longtime enemies, Iran and Saudi Arabia. How concerned are you by China playing a greater role as mediator in the Middle East? I'm very concerned because I want democracies to prevail. The Islamic Republic sends drones to Russia to use against Ukraine. Russia and China send surveillance equipment to the Islamic Republic to use against their protesters, against women flouting the compulsory hijab. They help each other's agendas. And we just haven't done that. We haven't even found a multinational approach to end hostage diplomacy. There's also been concerns that if there is another, to be another revolution in Iran, that this could be hijacked by groups that don't necessarily represent the Iranian people's calls for freedom. Is there any lessons we can take from the 1979 revolution to ensure that this doesn't happen? Today's liberal Iranian is not the anti-imperialist of yesteryear. They have really learned so much from 1979. They won't be fooled again. They don't want theocracy, they want secularism, they, um, and they want representative, accountable government. Now, what that looks like, will it be a monarchy? Will it be a constitutional monarchy or will it be a republic? Remains to be seen. That has to be up to the Iranian people to vote on um, and decide on. As a child of the revolution, no doubt uh, you have desired to revisit Iran should it turn to a secular democracy. What is your hope and dream and, and what would you do if you went there? Look, I get emotional thinking about it because the last time I was there was um, when I was 12, I turned 13, while I was in Tehran. And I just remember thinking, imagine this beautiful country with its warm, kind people. Imagine if there's freedom. Imagine if when people walk onto the streets, they don't fear the police and the security forces. They don't worry about being abducted 
or raped or gassed or tortured or impris wrongfully imprisoned, uh, executed, uh, forcibly disappeared. I hope that they can live under a system that respects their rights. Nazanin Boniadi, thank you for your time and your insights. Thank you.